Um, being that your knack was for uh, entrepreneurship, um, is this the point at which you felt like you found your way to be able to, I guess, uh, become a part of uh, the local music scene? Is that when it first? It, it really just happened bit by bit and inch by inch. Huh. Um, one of the big turning points for me was um, for our Mardi Gras group, which I'm the captain of, that we parade four floats in, we generally have a, a function on Thursday night when most people are just coming in town or the people who are in town are getting ready to start Mardi Gras. We do something on Thursday night having a band that, that sort of breaks the, breaks the ice and gets everybody together to, 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 to rev it up and start, mm -hmm. start the function. And uh, before that, we had been having a, a, a band play on Friday afternoons to sort of start having a lunch and then having a band play on Friday afternoons to start. So I had been booking bands in association with our Mardi Gras uh, parties for a little while and, and getting to know some of them and, and was at a point where uh, I really didn't have a favorite band or like a house band or somebody I, I wanted. And I, I called a friend of mine. Uh, who's in the music business full time, and asked him for a good young local funk band that uh, would really kick it up with our group, and he referred me to uh, this band Soul Project, mm -hmm. and and I booked Soul Project to play, not knowing them at all, and uh, during the first set of their gig, I really just was 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 drawn to them, mm -hmm. and so at the set break. I spent the set break at the bar talking to Christian, their leader, and we became friends instantly. And since then, we've done all sorts of things together. You know, the next year he came and rode on the floats with us, get a little experience of what we do Mardi Gras like. We booked him again. We started talking, and then over the next year or two, he and I came up with this idea along with our another friend Russell to do a rolling soundstage on a float where we would have a band roll on a float that would have studio quality sounding music on the float. And it was really Christian's idea. And Christian's like, look, you all put such great quality sound into your recorded music that you play on the three floats that you have. Yeah. What what would it be like if somebody put that type of effort into the sound of a live band in Mardi Gras? All the way up until this point, 2018, we've been booking bands and doing things like um, booking local bands and making a big deal out of them, making posters for them, throwing posters off the floats, making socks for them, handing socks out all the time. Yeah. We, the first act we did was George Porter. We made these purple socks with George Matters and him playing the bass. And Great. I went to the jam cruise and handed out like 200 pair of them to people. Yeah. Just, just just sort of like an emissary of New Orleans music and, and that atmosphere. You know, Christian and that relationship with Christian and sort of deciding to build the funky uncle is where a lot of things started because I don't want to build the funky uncle um, if we were just going to use it one time a year to parade. Right. I really wanted to build something if we were going to put the kind of time and effort into it that we could use at other times. And so my, uh, my commitment from my, my people that I'm working with in my group was we would build something that we could use and take out into the public and give away free music. Okay. to people yeah and and so that was the funky uncle was built with that dual intent and i got a commitment from barry kern who built the float that he would take it out when we had charity events and so we built the float we debuted it in 2018 but then we also that a month later had a little jazz fest for the homeless and that was our first event that we did where we brought the float out we had red beans and rice and jambalaya and gumbo and we invited homeless people we had a couple bands and we we did this whole little event and we started doing things like that three or four times a year and 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 through doing that trying to take music and and break down some barriers in 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 society give it away also get the musicians involved in some of the other things that that we're working on and doing um and, and that that was that was the start to the whole funky uncle experience that was going along just fine until COVID happened. Sure. And then COVID thrust me into the music business like knee deep. Really? Yeah. Because um, we already had this established practice of every two or three months 
using the float for charitable purposes. Mm. And so Christian called me right when COVID happened and said, look, man, I can't work. You know, they were gigging every night on Frenchman. Uh, what am I going to do? What are we going to do uh, with the funky uncle? You know, and, and we started talking about people were going to stream and do streaming shows. And then we got the idea we could just stream from the tux den. And we could we could use the float itself as a backdrop for streaming a show. Yeah. And he and I decided to do it. I think two weeks into COVID, we had our first show on a, uh, I think it was uh, April the third mm-hmm. was was the first show we had two thousand and twenty, um, and people started coming out of the woodwork when they heard what we were doing. I don't even know how they heard it. Right. You know, we were gonna we were gonna take two two iPhones. And set them up, and stream a band sure. set up in front of, and set up in front of the float. And before <clears> the <throat> time for the hit, we had a camera company, a lighting company, and all these people who volunteered, a sound company, people who heard about what we were doing, who volunteered to bring equipment and yeah. to bring people and to come and do it. And the Funky Uncle grew, what's called the Funky Uncle Live, grew out of that, and it evolved over a period of time. But through, but through the Funky Uncle over a period of two years, we had 104 different bands play. Yeah. And so, you know, everybody was doing everything. Christian and I were booking the bands and dealing with the bands. I would always try to get somebody to make a home-cooked meal, give the bands an opportunity to come and practice and rehearse a little bit, have the meal, and then do the show, sure. which would involve the interviews. And so I got to meet so many musicians that way. I was a fool. I thought when we first started doing the Funky Uncle, we couldn't find more than thirty bands that would be willing to come, <laughs> well, w- willing to come play a show. I had no idea we'd be able to find over a hundred unique bands. Sure. Yeah. I wanted to ask you: uh, w- Was anybody, to your knowledge, uh, live? St- like, I-, I mean, live streaming became commonplace shortly after the onset of COVID. But in the beginning, uh, I mean, this was one person's discovery of a means to an end that really caught on like wildfire and became a medium for everyone. Right. Um, had you seen that before? No. Had Christian seen that before? It, no. It, it's just something that y'all came up with on the fly. No, we, he, he just came up with the idea that we would do it over the phone and live stream it. I think when we streamed our first show, some other people had started to do it. I hadn't seen it, but people were mentioning to me that some musicians were starting to, to stream from there for the living room mm-hmm. as a means to try to make money. But as far as I know, nobody was live streaming from a club or or a venue and doing like a whole band right right because you weren't supposed to be on the street you weren't supposed to be next to people you weren't right. supposed to be with each other and we were breaking all sorts of rules by having bands play together now we did if you look at those early shows we spaced people out uh, you know in our set very far away from each other um, we even had a lot of musicians who wore masks during the performance mm-hmm. everybody would wear a mask off, off stage, but during the performance, some people wore masks on stage. But I went from the point where I was relatively out of the music business completely and, and not part of it at all to talking to bands, talking to agents, talking to gig workers, talking to cameramen, talking to, to, to people who work behind the scenes every day. And, and every day I'm on the phone talking to people and it also gave me a real real education not only in what you see when you look at the band but what's behind the band mm-hmm. you know everything that goes on to produce uh, a show okay all of all of what happens from a filming perspective what happens from an audio perspective what happens from a lighting perspective the venue how you have to have how you have to deal with the venue and mm-hmm. I just uh, like a little kid in a candy store you know I was just eating it up and I think part of part of what allowed me to explore it with such innocence was the fact that I wasn't making money at it, that it was completely a charity. There was no profit-driven motive whatsoever. And as a result of that, people seem to be drawn to it. It's disarming, I think. When, you, when you're doing it for free, yeah. it's kind of disarming. It makes you more approachable. And pe- people, people seem to be drawn to it. Sure. And before you knew it, we were giving money to Offbeat and Tipitinas and the Maple Leaf. And, and we weren't just supporting musicians. We weren't just supporting gig workers. The whole thing grew 
uh, just exponentially. And, you know, a big component of that was Frenchie. You know, I can't go much further without mentioning Frenchie. Um, Frenchie's also a tux float captain, just like I am. Okay. I had never met Frenchie before. And our float was sitting uh, here, so to speak, and Frenchie's float was over here. And Frenchie's got a really cool looking float. And Christian said, wouldn't it be cool if we put Frenchie's float and our float next to each other and we made like a V and you had two sides to to the backdrop for, for where the musicians were playing? Mm-hmm. I said, man, that sounds great. Uh, you know, it, Christian didn't know Frenchie either. So somehow we found his phone number and Christian called him and said, hey, man, we want to borrow your float. Do you mind if we move your float over and use it? He goes, well, you don't want me to come paint? Nice. <laughs> and, yeah. And we're like, sure, come paint. So by like, I don't know. I mean, these are the first 40 shows right here. Uh-huh. Uh, so I think probably by the second. Yeah, no, he painted the, the set for the second show. Uh, the Soul Brass Band. He, he was there. So, so for the second show, he was there painting. And of the 106 shows, I think he painted 89 of them. Mm-hmm. And we sold the Frenchie painting, either auctioned it on TV, or we had people who came to the den who bought them. And those Frenchie paintings um, were the single biggest source of revenue that we had during the Funky Uncle. And so he would take a, a percentage of what we sold it for, uh, always less than 50%, sometimes even 10 or 20%, just depending on the deal. And the rest of it would go to the charity, to the musicians and the gig workers. Yeah. And I fed off of his generosity and his spirit tremendously because uh, he's such a giver. And Frenchie's so well known in the music community that he became an integral part of what we did and our connection to musicians. And he introduced me to a whole lot of people and got me involved at a, at a much deeper level. Sure. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's spectacular. I was reading about his method and how uh, he kind of steals a scene in his mind, I guess, if you will, and then uh, immediately is, is putting it down on canvas kind of from memory, you know. Um, and to be doing it in the midst of, uh, of live entertainment, I think that's pretty cool, man. It is super cool. Yeah. And it shocks me how fast it can happen. Right. Right? So he takes a white canvas, generally. Sometimes it works with a black canvas. But he takes a white canvas, generally. Mm-hmm. And as you say, steals the scene in his mind. Yeah. And he starts to, to, to pencil sketch uh, the scene. Mm-hmm. And the shows mostly were 60 to 75 minutes worth of music. And in that period of time, 60 to 75 minutes, he could pencil sketch the scene, start coloring it in, and have it mostly finished, sometimes complete, yeah. by the end of the 75 minutes. That's fantastic. Just blow your mind that it could happen that fast. Yeah. And if you watch him do it, you realize that he operates at like a four times speed when he's in the zone of creating than anybody normally operates. I can't imagine he, a better His atmosphere. body is moving <laughs> so fast, yeah. and, and his mind is so focused and, and centered on what he's doing. Sure. It's just beautiful. And, and, you know, it's really a whole genre of painting. The, the Frenchy COVID art from the Funky Uncle is itself a body of work mm-hmm. that is different than other Frenchy paintings. And then if you look in the Frenchy work itself, it evolves over a period of time because his float was positioned in one place for a while. He painted from the catbird seat in his float. Oh, and okay. so there's a certain positioning to it. And then when he changed the perspective of where he painted, you can tell in the history of the paintings. And then there's certain things that he adds to the paintings that he did and didn't do. And in the end, he's experimenting with some tape and putting tape on it and painting around the tape and then taking it off and painting other things. Yeah. And so you can sort of see that experimentation at the end of it, too. And it's kind of like looking at a musician's career and seeing how, or an artist's career and seeing how the music evolves over a period of time. Yeah. Frenchie's painting during COVID evolved over a period of time. And I hope that people will look back on, on this at some point. Uh, particularly with Frenchie's work, and say that that you know th- that they can appreciate and see um, see those evolutions. Sure, it's funny that uh, he'll have a 
a catalog of work that's characterized by a, um, a pandemic. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> you know, that's but right. it, it turned he turned something uh, something uh, I guess negative into a positive. But it's also ironic how all of this impacted you, I believe, and many musicians because it was the inspiration for albums, solo albums. Um, a lot of remote work was done, but uh, albums nonetheless that maybe would have been put on hold because they were gigging live so often to pay bills, you know, and then right. when that wasn't an option, uh, they still felt the need to express themselves and did so with other means. Um, but it's funny uh, how it, it actually pulled you in. You think it would disperse everyone. I mean, it did. Well, it, I think it, essence, had, a, it yeah. had a different effect on different people. Right. Right. Uh, I'm watching this TV show right now, well, New Amsterdam mm -hmm. on Netflix, and you you know look at the TV personification of what it did to some people, isolated them. Um, I was not willing to stay at home. You know, I run a homeless organization too, Grace at the Green Light. We were the only organization that fed for the first two months. Uh, everybody else closed. Oh wow! So if you wanted if you wanted breakfast, lunch, or dinner, and you were on the street. You had to come to Grace at the Green Light, and so we were feeding three meals a day for sixty days, uh, and and I had to get out and work on that. And so between working on feeding people and working on the Funky Uncle, I was out all the time, sure, and, and working all the time. And I actually was working harder during COVID than I had before uh, because there were so many challenges, and I was doing new things, you know, expanding into new things. Uh, it thrust me in my life into doing 80-90% service work and I haven't turned back since. Even though COVID has disbanded and, and fallen apart, the pathway that this has led me down, uh, the funky uncle and grace at the green light and doing mostly service work is something that I've continued to chase that path and I think that God has provided that for me not as an intentional decision that I made but just sort of a, a you know consequential outcome uh, sure. to, to the circumstances and I've, con I've decided to sort of commit my life to, to that now.